of you here to this meeting at the Middle East Institute at the National University of Singapore uh, for a very special session, part of our continuing series of events and analyses on the wave of protest that is now affecting the whole Arab world. And we're very fortunate today to have persuaded Dr. Munir Fakhro, who is a an internationally known scholar and a leading uh, participant and activist uh, in Bahraini affairs uh, to join us from Bahrain uh, to uh, give us her analysis of what has happened and maybe her predictions as to what will happen. I would like uh, to introduce uh, both panelists formally. Uh, and I'll begin, first of all, with our first speaker, who is our visiting uh, research associate here at the Middle East Institute, uh, Camille Germanos, from Lebanon. Uh, she uh, uh, is working uh, on a project here dealing with perceptions of Hezbollah in Lebanon, but she has a very broad background in social theory and history uh, uh, of the Middle East. And she has kindly agreed to open up our panel today uh, with a, an introduction to uh, Bahrain's uh, history, geography, uh, demography, and society. Uh, uh, Camille uh, uh, speaks Arabic, French, and English. Uh, she always likes to remind me to remind you that English is her third language. Uh, so bear with her, but I think you will find that she is completely comprehensible. Uh, and she uh, has been working at the French School for Advanced Studies in Social Sciences. She has a law degree, a Master of Arts degree in Communications, and a Master of Philosophy degree in Comparative Development Studies from France. Our main speaker, um, and our, our, main, our main speaker today, as I mentioned, is Dr. Munira Fakhro. Uh, she is a Bahraini academic. She was a candidate in the 2006 general election for the opposition Wa'ad party in Bahrain. She's an associate professor at the University of Bahrain. She has a doctorate from Columbia University in social policy planning and administration. Uh, she has conducted research on gender, citizenship, and civil society in the Gulf states and at the Center for Middle East Studies at Harvard. She has published on Bahrain, uh, uh, particularly on issues relating to women, civil society, and democratization. Uh, so I can't think of anybody more appropriate to be talking to us uh, at this moment when the <coughs> is on the cusp of, uh, of something. We don't know what, but it's important. So uh, having, having said that, I would like now to uh, turn the microphone to Camille uh, Germanos. So it's all yours, please. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Dr. Munir, during this time, Camille is going to use a PowerPoint, so we won't be able to see you, but we'll still be able to hear you. Okay, sure. And then we'll switch back so we can see you as well. Yes. Okay. Oh, yes, that's a good idea. Okay. of the island is the pillar of my introduction, as in history, Bahrain has been bouncing between two cultures, trying to expand over the same territory, the Persian Gulf and the Arab Gulf. 
After it fell under the British colonization, the island was ruled by the Al Khalifa ascendancy, originally from the Arab Peninsula namely Najd. The stable rule of Al Khalifa over Bahrain was part of a knitted sheikhdom the British put in place to protect the gold sources of oil supply. Like many other oil producers in the Middle East, Bahrain underwent a rapid economic transition. The majority of the Bahraini, mainly from the Shia Muslim sect, traditionally poor merchants and fishermen, were undergoing exclusion from the best paid jobs in the private modern economic sector. The emergence of a ruling elite, a nouveau rich class, and the marginalization of the new poor created a climate of mistrust among social classes. The social unrest was expressed by what became a serious political opposition in the 50s. Although there is a dispute over the benefits of oil production to a flourishing civil society, it is argued that the government of Bahrain failed to address the social problems as development issues. Instead, the government of the island states is reproached to having discriminated the majority of the population who was prevented from the highest and best paid civil service posts. Scholars argue that the Bahraini opposition was continuously oppressed, and whenever the ruling family announced political reforms, for the facade, they secured their votes by naturalizing Sunni Arabian client tribes who do not even live in Bahrain. Add to this social climate, the presence in high numbers of foreign man manpower, 39% of the population, the stateless people of the Gulf relatively low in Bahrain, and the territorial dispute now settled among the Arabs and with the Persian state. Imagine this amount of serious political and sociological problems congested on a, small, on a small archipelago counting about a million people. Bahrain might be a mini-state, but is, it is located amidst the biggest oil reserves of the planet, on the main oil shipping routes, it is facing Iran, and last but not least, part of the Arab states and monarchies of the Gulf. Although the current social unrest in Bahrain and request for reforms does not include, include any sectarian slogans, or maybe not yet, it is perceived as a trigger for social unrest in the Arab States of the Gulf. As to the risk of the social unrest expansion, the unfolding threats to the strategic presence of the U.S. Army in the Gulf. Ladies and gentlemen, Bahrain is a serious question, and I will do my best to introduce to you its history, hoping to set the scene for a better understanding of our honorable speaker, Dr. Fakhru, and our director, Professor Hassan. For centuries, Bahrain was a major point on the sea routes between the fertile crescent of India and the center for the international fur trade. Its shores had been frequented by merchants, sailors, artisans, soldiers from the Arabian Peninsula, Iran, Mesopotamia, India, and most recently Europe. Political control of the islands has changed frequently, amid circumstances that occasionally involved major population movements. The latest Persian rule of the Bahrain archipelago dates back to 1602, when the Portuguese who had occupied the island since 1522 were driven out. But the authority of the Persian Shah was challenged all through the 18th century by Arab neighbors, who ended up most of the time by transmitting the island's revenue to the Persians. In 1783, with Al Khalifa becoming the masters of Bahrain, there was a shift in the political balance of the Gulf from the Persian to the Arabian shores. Since the end of the 18th century, the Persian claim to ownership and sovereignty over the Bahrain Islands never stopped. In the 20th century, in 1906 and 1927, this claim has been put forward in earnest by Persia. In 1928, a Persian protest was given to the Secretary General of the League of Nations, but it only hit the British engagement and the island's rulers to Bahrain independence. Until today, scholars debate on Bahrain sovereignty over the 19th century and Persian claim over Bahrain. No matter how biased the arguments might be, this debate says a lot about Bahrain's sensitivity towards stability or changes in today's Iran. Where do Al Khalifa come from? Al Khalifa are part of the tribes ruling houses descending from a larger Arab Bedouin tribe, the Jumaila. Kinship ties them with As Sabah, rulers of Kuwait, Al Rumi, and Al Jalalima. All of them claim descent from Anaiza, a larger group of tribes scattered through the peninsula of Arabi, Syria, and Iraq. This claimed genealogy make them Beni Al-Am, meaning paternal cousins, with the one of the larger and most powerful Bedouins of the deserts. Let me share with you the gene genealogical tree of the Anaiza tribes. And then this map, 
and see where the people of this nation tri uh, tribe are spread in the Syrian desert. And finally, uh, this is how the Al Khalifa would trace the migration of their branch. As we said earlier, the Al Khalifa mastership over Bahrain dates back to 1782. There was an attempt of the Prince of Shiraz to chastise Al Khalifa. Instead, the Parsi were defeated and compelled to withdraw. But the Al Khalifa suzerain ascendancy over Bahrain was not uninterrupted. They were frequently troubled by their Saudi and Omani neighbors. Most and for all paid tribute to the one or the other. This was also to be occasionally the case in the 19th century with their Parsi neighbor. The guarantee of the Bahraini territorial integrity came from the British in the 19th century. This was a time when the British interests in Bahrain were a direct consequence of their resolution with the Indian government to put an end to the large-scale piracies committed by the maritime tribes of the Arabian coast. It was actually the British authorities in India who had to weigh the pretensions of Persia and those of the Arabs over Bahrain. In fact, the British policy was as much opposed to the Wahhabi as to Persian attacks on Bahrain. Why? Simply because the government of India needed only to suppress piracy and slave trade in the region. They needed stability and truth, reducing to the maximum the tribal wars on the land. Those were indeed difficult years of internal tribal quarrels. The reported anarchy and chaos of Kuwait and Qatar, which had resulted from Saudi family rivalries, prompted an Ottoman military intervention in 1870. The British were blamed among Ottoman administrators for the ongoing troubles in the interland of the Italian states. Having invaded the Arabic Peninsula, the Ottomans were unable to stabilize the area and reorganize the administration in subsequent years for financial shortage. In Iraq, for example, Mithat Basha has succeeded in reorganizing the administration of land and in settling some of the nomadic tribes, neither of which were seriously attempted in Kuwait and Arabia. As we said, the empire lacked the capital for developing the infrastructure necessary for communication and intelligence gathering in the region, which continually hampered officials in Istanbul and the periphery. The answer to unrest was open military intervention, but after the initial inv investments of troops in 1871, the Ottoman military was diverted by events in the Balkans and elsewhere, generally unavailable for use of the southern frontier. These events partially explain why the Ottoman sovereignty over Bahrain was just nominal. The Turkish Empire had a deal with the British and benefited from the shipping activities in the Persian Gulf. One of the consequences of this Ottoman hegemony in the Gulf is the territorial disputes between Qatar and Bahrain over the Hawar A Islands and Dubara as part of the border disputes arising from the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire. Ten years after the Ottomans invaded the Gulf in 1880, the Sheikh of Bahrain surrendered his external sovereignty to, to Britain. Between then and World War I, the government of India in the name of the United Kingdom took over the external sovereignty from the Arab rulers in the Gulf. On the military level, this was a plan to prevent other European powers from establishing a military presence in the Gulf. Later on, only the US Navy was permitted in 1949 to share a base at Bahrain. However, American military presence in the Gulf, even after the Suez crisis in 1956, was only meant to consolidate the British military presence in the region. On the economic level, between 1913 and 1922, the government of India procured from the governor of Bahrain explicit promise not to grant oil concessions to anyone, to anyone except with British approval. As you see, the primary interest had become to protect, protect the Gulf sources of oil supply for the West. This interest appeared to be a threat when the British government announced in 1968 that it would withdraw from the Persian Gulf before the end of 1971. Whilst the British were hoping for a federation between Bahrain, Qatar, or the Trushan uh, tribalities, none of those were enthusiastic about joining a federation and sharing the pot potential or ro royalties. Soon after, Bahrain declared its independence and the country was admitted to, to membership in the UN in 1971. This independence was also endorsed by Iran, an American ally ruled by the Shah. This was the time of Nasser anti-monarchial campaign in the Gulf, pushing the Saudis and the Iranians together. History has changed today, 
but those were days when a powerful Iranian <coughs> influence in the region was useful to discourage the Soviet Union from establishing a permanent naval encourage in the Gulf. Who are the Bahraini? Only when the British stabilized borders and regimes in the Gulf were real barriers to population movement erected and residents made as important political as ethnic uh, origin. The British administration distinguished between people who were Bahrain subjects and all others who, regardless of our actual nationality, had pretext to put themselves under British protection and jurisdiction. This administrative distinction, a result of increasing British involvement in local affairs, defined a group of people whose descents constitute the majority of Bahraini today. By the turn of the 20th century, a Bahraini population could be defined. The Bahraini population was very diverse, Sunni, Shia, Arab, Persian, tribal, non-tribal, while outside contact and influence were considerable. The actual number of foreigners living in Bahrain was quite small. The status of the Arabs and the Persians was ambiguous, as travel between Bahrain and their various places of origin was frequent. Although the Bahraini opposition could erupt in sectarian riots, it would be unfair to describe the opposition in sectarian ways. It is more about social malaise and governing elites, politically discriminating and economically marginalizing a major part of the population. To understand the Bahraini opposition, it should be remembered that Bahraini society had been progressive long before the national oil company Bafco started its operation in 1933. Bahrain had the first schools run on modern lines in 1990. It con in contrast with the old-fashioned Quranic schools, the people were raised up with modern institutions, <coughs> system of social services since the early days of the 20th century. Since 1929, Bahraini started to suffer from unemployment, working in efficient economic sec sectors such as fishing and traditional crafts. The slump in the fur trade caused by the general financial recession in Europe affected the fur divers, the shopkeepers, and the government. The revenue had shrunk from 100,000 pounds in 1926 to 5,000 pounds in 1933. Although the first well of oil came in in 1933, the first oil royalties were pretty poor. Gradually, with the rise of oil industry, the former fur merchants were becoming poor, and a new class of oil merchants, shipping agents, and contractors was to become the nouveau riche of the Bahraini society. There is a debate on how beneficial the oil revenues were to the Bahraini society and infrastructure. While some defend the thesis of social development policies, others depict a social malaise, whereas the educated Bahraini seek work abroad in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. The unskilled Bahraini were underrepresented in the modern economic sector that grew up around the oil industry, where, where they worked on a seasonal or casual basis. This pattern began to change in 1938, when workers of the refinery expressed economic grievances, this major outbreak was to be followed in the 50s and 60s by riots and uh, of an organized opposition. So, the opposition movement in the 50s. The 50s are marked by the alliance of the British with the Bahraini government facing together a fragmented opposition. Whilst in 53 the disturbance erupted in sectarian riots, in 54 both Sunni and Shia joined behind, de behind demands for an elected parliament, a standardized legal code, and independent labor unions. In 56, opposition movements were suppressed. 60s and 70s. In the 60s, the opposition continued to be active underground with occasional public outbursts in the form of strikes and demonstrations. The most serious of these occurred in 65 and in 1972. Overall, when Britain granted Bahrain formal independence in 71, it appeared that the island state might follow a unique path in the Gulf toward relatively democratic political institutions and diversified <coughs> economic development. The parliament instituted in 73 was dissolved by decree in 75. Since then, the rule of the Khalifa family has become increasingly authoritarian. Ladies and gentlemen, this small introduction to the history of Bahrain, of the Bahraini acquisition, aims to give you a background for a better understanding of the political practices that followed and that are depicted in the paper that is circulating today. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Camille, very much for that uh, excellent and comprehensive and well-illustrated account of uh, the, the rather complicated 
background uh, to Bahrain. Before I uh, uh, turn the microphone to Dr. Munira Fakhro, um, let me just say to the audience, um, in case some of you are wondering, why are we paying any attention to this tiny little place? Uh, I think uh, a few months ago, uh, when we were planning our research agenda, Bahrain probably would not have figured. But the reason, of course, is that the, the remarkable wave of protest that is sweeping across the Arab world from the Atlantic Ocean to the Gulf and beyond uh, has now uh, reached uh, Bahrain. And as you could tell from the maps which uh, Camille showed us, Bahrain's location makes it of uh, inescapable importance uh, to the world at large. And I think the reason, the fundamental reason that we here in Singapore and indeed around the world are looking at Bahrain is because, it, it, because of where it is. Uh, we've got uh, Al Jazeera playing continuously here in the Middle East Institute and uh, just a moment ago, we were watching pictures of uh, Bahrainis uh, demonstrating in front of the U.S. Embassy in Manama, uh, trying to uh, express their demands for democracy uh, in a regime that does not really practice democracy. But Al Jazeera is also showing us the price of oil. And while all eyes at the moment, perhaps, are focused on Libya, uh, where we're looking to, uh, it looks like a prolonged struggle between protesters and rebels on the one hand and the beleaguered regime of Muammar al-Qaddafi on the other. Part of the reason for the price spike in oil is not Libya. It has to do with Bahrain and it has to do with Bahrain's intimate connections uh, with Saudi Arabia. And that is what I think uh, really alarms the uh, oil traders and the stock markets around the world. Because if protests <coughs> spread to Bahrain and if, if, if protests lead to turmoil, uh, what will happen? And I'll come back, uh, if time permits, and after Dr. Fakhro has spoken, to elaborate a little bit on that. But just to introduce her uh, uh, and introduce uh, Bahrain, I think it's important to uh, realize that what happens in Bahrain uh, may very well affect uh, what is happening uh, right next door. The wave of protest in the Arab world is taking many forms uh, and uh, we're, we're going to hear now about the first major expression of protest in that privileged small club of Arab oil exporting monarchies of the Gulf Cooperation Council. So, without further ado, uh, we turn the floor over to Dr. Munira Fakhro, please. Hello, Professor Markel, and uh, hello, Kami. Uh, <clears throat> it's a privilege to, to talk to you. And uh, Singapore is always, and was always, uh, taken as a model for development for Bahrain policy makers. Maybe because of size and uh, it's, uh, the, the model, I'm sure, did not succeed and many circumstances uh, affected this. But uh, as you, as Camille said, <clears throat> it's, it's, oh, it's not sectarian, what we are witnessing now, it's about political rights and uh, social grievances. Uh, uh, also, what happened all around the Arab world is, it's not contagious, but most Arab countries are ready for revolting uh, and already, already for asking, uh, asking the you know, policy makers uh, uh, for many demands. And this is what happened to Bahrain. It was the first among the Gulf Cooperation Council to start this, because it started it before. Now it's attracting uh, attention internationally. But <clears throat> Bahrain had witnessed lots of upheavals, starting from 
1938, when the uh, when the workers in the uh, new Babco oil industry started revolting and uh, demonstrating to raise their salaries. Then in 1956, when Bahrain witnessed the biggest upheaval and it was crushed by the British. Uh, uh, then in 1997 and 1972, uh, Bahrain uh, had its independence, 71, and uh, 73, uh, there was a parliament which has been dissolved in 1975. Bahrain stayed under, under emergency law for 27 years until the new king, who became a new emir, who became a king in 2000. And two, uh, we had lots of promises, and those promises never fulfilled. Uh, uh, we were supposed to have a parliament uh, full uh, that has the full authority for the by the people, and now we see all the power is in the hand of the king. So the promises never fulfilled, and <clears throat> there were lots of demonstrations, all, uh, especially in the last decade, 10 years. Uh, 14th of February, when the demonstration started, uh, marked the, the 10th year of the, <clears throat> as it's called, the uh, reforming uh, age, as they call it, Lahl uh, Zahar, Islahat, as we call it in, in Arabic. The, the, what happened also is, uh, the, I mean, why it's mostly Shia and not Sunnah? As you know, uh, rural development is slower than city development. And uh, village uh, uh, dwellers uh, mainly were not uh, educated in the 20th century and they are calling for the fall of the government and electing a new interim government. Uh, also, they are calling for uh, lots of demands, uh, financial, social, and other demands. But the most important one is the, uh, of course, solve, uh, uh, dissolving the two upper and lower uh, chambers of the parliament the elected and the uh, appointed ones. Uh, we are not sure how the system, how the crown prince will uh, meet such demands, but we are sure that there are not so many players other than the Shia and the opposition. Uh, we are part of the GCC, and the GCC is, as you know, it's very rich and it's funding uh, lots of our projects, especially Saudi Arabia. We have the pipeline coming from Saudi Arabia. We have the oil field that we share 50% of its revenue. And also we have the tourists coming every day, thousands of them from Saudi Arabia for a more comfortable, I can say, and when I say comfortable, it's not that individuals come and drink and eat. No, it's uh, many families, Saudi families come, they enjoy going to the movies where there isn't any movie theater in Saudi Arabia. They uh, have, you know, they go to restaurants with their families. They do just normal things as we do. And uh, also Bahrainis all go uh, to Saudi Arabia to buy subsidized items and uh, even to buy oil because oil is heavily subsidized there. So the, through the causeway that was established, built in 1986, the connection with Saudi Arabia became very, very strong. I, I can, maybe I might stop and uh, <clears throat> if you can ask me any question. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you. Thank you very much. And I think that uh, 
Um, I will say only two things, really, before we <coughs> open it up for, for your questions uh, to uh, uh, Dr. Munira or to uh, Camille. Uh, one thing is that, uh, as you've heard, I think, from both speakers, uh, Bahrain is, is quite different from the other small sheiklands and states of the Gulf Cooperation Council. This council, as you know, consists of six states, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates, and uh, Oman. But as we've heard uh, from both speakers, uh, there has been more of a history of political consciousness, uh, uh, social ferment and modernization in Bahrain than really in the other places, although Kuwait in some ways is quite uh, similar. But whereas in Kuwait, broadly speaking, the ruling Al Sabah family uh, uh, allowed and was somewhat constrained by a political process of elections and parliaments and participation, uh, this was not so much the case as we've heard in Bahrain. And so it appears that there is some kind of bottled up resentment, particularly over certain <coughs> political issues that has surfaced in a surprisingly public way in, uh, in this country. Uh, we have not seen anything quite like this in any of the other five Gulf states, although there have been some labor-related demonstrations lately in Kuwait, and quite surprisingly, we've seen some uh, social and uh, economic demonstrations in Oman. So uh, Bahrain, in a sense, is, is a kind of a bellwether, perhaps, of things to come. And as we are seeing now, uh, the, this contagion or this Arab awakening, whatever you choose to call it, that <coughs> began with the events in Bahrain and Egypt and is reverberating throughout the region, has also now begun to reach Saudi Arabia itself. And while the demonstrations there in the eastern province over the weekend were, were fairly small, they perhaps were indicative of things to come and there appears to be a considerable worry on the part of the Saudi authorities that the turbulence uh, or the protests in Bahrain, to the extent that they do have a sectarian character, could uh, encourage the Shia population which dominates in eastern Saudi Arabia uh, to protest as well. So we're looking at a situation in which, in a sense, Bahrain is like a fuse uh, and uh, there are many people that are concerned that the whole uh, traditional monarchical order of the Gulf is challenged. If, if, if negotiations along the line that Dr. Fakhro is encouraging do not, in fact, take place or lead to a positive result, <coughs> will there then be an actual challenge to the Al Khalifa dynasty of Bahrain? And if there is a serious challenge, what would that mean? Uh, it, it seems to me that uh, this would be a, a, uh, a development that Saudi Arabia would, would not ignore. And so one of the questions that we may have uh, for uh, Dr. Munira uh, is where might things go if a negotiating process with uh, the Crown Prince fails? One more point, and that is uh, just a, a word about the larger global dimension here. Uh, as Camille mentioned, uh, for a long time the British uh, exercised a kind of a protective cover over the Gulf. Uh, as Britain's empire gradually faded after Suez in 1956 and beyond, uh, Britain retreated from the Gulf by 1971. For a moment, there was a concern that the Shah of Iran might revive old Persian claims to Bahrain, but he was persuaded not to do that, uh, and uh, Bahrain in did indeed become independent. The small American naval presence uh, that had been there for quite a long time remained small. I had an old colleague uh, back at Georgetown University who was a retired admiral by the name of Marmaduke Bain, who I think maybe Dr. Munira would have known, uh, he subsequently passed away, but he was the commander of the Middle East force based at Bahrain 
uh, just uh, in the transition period from the British to independence. And he liked to say that he had only two small ships at his disposal. It was not really a military mission. And he liked to say that he regarded his role not uh, as a military officer, but really as a diplomat. And he spent a lot of time basically uh, sailing up and down the Gulf, uh, showing the flag, and uh, uh, doing good deeds, really, for the local people. Things have changed very much since those days, and now the Bahrain is the seat of a, a much larger American military presence, a kind of permanent American military presence in the Gulf that has gradually grown up because of the instability in the region that has occurred really since the Iran-Iraq War from 1980 to 88 and continuing today. So there is a very major American naval presence there, and that's why Washington uh, uh, is, is doubly concerned, I think, about the way things might go in Bahrain. Concerned on the one hand about oil supplies, concerned that uh, Iran might try to take advantage of turmoil in uh, Bahrain, uh, concerned about what the American military or political role, if any, should be uh, if things continue to be very tense or even if they explode again into violence in Bahrain. So these are issues that I think are on the minds of people from the outside. Now I'm going to open the floor to, to comments. We now have uh, quite a large uh, group of people here in our conference room uh, uh, in Singapore. And uh, we will open the floor. We will ask the speakers actually to come up to the camera so that Dr. Munira can see you. And if you would uh, briefly identify yourself and uh, make a comment or question, we ask you, as always, to make your comment or question as brief as possible. And you may address either Dr. Munira or uh, Ms. Camille Germanus or myself uh, for questions <coughs> or comments. So the floor is open. People are, I think, so uh, uh, overwhelmed by uh, what they've occurred that, that they, are, they are not coming forth. Uh, but here, here, I think there is a question, please. Would um, you stand up? And yeah. Stand up? Yes, please. Oh, stand up right here. And then yeah. speak into the microphone. The camera is right here. So if you look here, just My name is Mohammed bin Talib. Yemeni origin, Singaporean residing there. In spite of the assurances by Camille Janus and Dr. Munira Fakhru that the uh, message that they're going to deliver this evening is not sectarian, but the portrayal by the whole, whole media in the world is uh, very much uh, Shiaism, a part of Shiaism in um, But Shiaism, is, uh, is uh, very much feared like Islamophobia in the West by the Western people. But what is interesting here to note from the uprising in Tunis and in Cairo, there is no sectarian feeling or religious. I was very overwhelmed when I saw the, the protesters in Tahrir Square. The Christians and the Muslims were together. And the Christians were guarding the Muslims when they were praying, and the Muslims were guarding the Christians when they were praying. For the first time in the Middle East, they've submerged all uh, racial hatred uh, and uh, religious uh, differences and sectarian issues. This is a new dawn to the Middle East. What the youth in the Middle East have done uh, for the benefit of everybody here is that um, they are not asking for democracy. Democracy is a very loose word. There is no such thing as perfect democracy. They are asking for human values, humanitarian values. They're asking for their dignity, their rights, and there is now um, uh, that the youth are unemployed mostly, and, and they want many issues to be addressed: transparency, uh, they're against cronyism, against corruption, against you name that can go until tomorrow morning. But this has been discussed in the internet, and the catalyst, of course, is the digital revolution itself. Uh, memberships uh, are 
to the number of 70,000 in Egypt and 50,000 in Tunis, discussing details about what they are asking for, renewal, quality education, and uh, so on. But what is the awareness that this meeting is trying to give today, by introducing Bahrain, is a big question, but I'd like to know. Thank you. So the question is, what is the awareness what is for, for Bahrain in the context of the Middle East Okay. All right. Did, did you hear that, Dr. Madeira? Yes, the awareness? Yes, please. I mean, what do you mean when you say that? I think he means how does Bahrain's situation uh, relate to the larger yeah. protest that's going on? Yeah. What significant role can but Bahrain play? All around the Arab world. Yes, in the big uh, picture of the Arab world. And Bahrain is a very, I'm not trying to insult Bahrain, it. it's quite, quite small. She, she can't hear Bahrain is very small with a population of over 1 million. And what, what sort of awareness you're trying but, but if you think, uh, uh, if you are trying to say that you are denying that it's a Shia uprising, what other awareness does Bahrain will play? What, what is the role? I don't okay. see. It. Thank you. Well, it's true that all, nearly few, uh, demonstrators are Shia, but they are having carrying the grievances of all Bahrain. And I always say, if when the Shia demonstrate and revolt and get some of the rights, the Sunni benefit. The Sunni benefit. The Shia form seventy percent of the population. The Sunni are thirty percent only. And what the government did in the last decade and before that, but in the last decade, was very clear that they started a program to uh, nationalize Arabs, tribal Arabs, Sunnah, from Syria, Jordan, southern Yemen, and from Baluchistan. And it happened secretly when those people come, brought from their, you know, tribal places, uh, they are given passports and uh, employment, especially in the army and in the, uh, the Ministry of Interiors. And they are giving housing while the uh, Bahrainis and mainly Shia are waiting for their turn to get, I mean, for the limited income people, the, uh, the housing. The housing is a very big problem. Uh, uh, also corruption, corruption started, I mean, for a long time, but it was so severe in the last decade. Uh, we just, we notice and see and know exactly who is taking what, especially from the reclamation of land. And as one of the parliament members uh, explained, by statistics and tables, uh, during the last election, my turn, that, uh, 17 square kilometers were reclaimed, worth of uh, six, uh, no, 65 kilo, square kilometers worth of 17 billion dollars, dinar as they say, not dollars. And it all went to the pockets of the, I can't say, the upper, uh, you know, policy maker, few, few. <coughs> And people knew that, and they were waiting, and the uh, increase in prices, and uh, the grievances, and the arrests of the Shia maybe. But there are Shia who are supporting the system. Uh, Shia who are uh, having, getting lots of favors. And the government is welcoming those people. So to show it's not, they are treating Shia and Sunnah the same. It's not, Shia are not allowed to join the army, Shia are not allowed to join the Ministry of Interiors. Uh, <clears throat> just the day before yesterday, the government announced that they will that they are providing 20,000 jobs for the Ministry of Interiors open, and this is a, a part of the solution. That the 20,000, I mean, for the first time, the Shia will join the Ministry of Interiors. Also, uh, they announced that 50,000 unit, housing units will be built in the coming five years. And of course, this will need a lot of money, and that's why the Crown Prince toured last week, 
toward the Gulf states, and he was promised that uh, he would be, you know, given lots of financing to finance all such project, projects to raise the salaries, to build the housing units, and to do lots to improve the status, the, uh, the, the living status uh, for all the Bahrainis. And that's why I'm telling you that when the Shia demonstrate, the Sunnah also benefit. And I always, I'm a Sunnah, and I always tell the Sunnah that they are killed, they are, uh, you know, uh, arrested, and all of you get the benefit of all this. Thank you. Could I ask you a, uh, a question, uh, Munir? I don't know whether you can see me or not, but uh, yes. uh, you can see part of me, I think. Um, yes. Uh, let me just... Uh, no, no, you can see me. That's okay. Yeah. All right? Yeah, okay. Yes, All right. now I can oh, see Okay, very good. I'm just taller than most my, my question uh, is, a, is a double question, and it has to do with the balance of political forces in Bahrain at the moment. The first part is... Do you detect uh, a serious uh, difference within the ruling family, within the regime, about how to deal with these demands that are coming from the protesters? Uh, one suspects that there must be hardliners who are ready to shoot demonstrators, and softliners, and perhaps the Crown Prince is one of them from what you were saying, but I wondered if you could comment on uh, the yeah. degree of coherence and solidarity and the, the general mood of the uh, Al Khalifa rulers. The second part has to do with the nature of the opposition, and I wondered if you could just outline for us the main groups and tendencies within the opposition uh, that are, and the demands uh, that they are making. Thank you. Yes, uh, first I would like to say that uh Extremism and extremists come from both sides, from the Shia, which is called Haq, I mean there are movements, extremists I can say, and from the Roman ruling family. And there are many members of the ruling family that oppose the Crown Prince initiative. Uh, maybe you have uh, read uh, Gregory Goh's uh, article three days ago that uh, uh, he explained how uh, the ruling families in the Gulf are different than the ruling and royals in Morocco, Jordan, for example, uh, because the ruling families in the Gulf, most of them rule because the prime minister is the uncle of the king. The, I mean, there are 17 ministers in the cabinet, and they are all over as directors, act, uh, under secretaries, and they are all over, uh, especially in the army and, and the Ministry of Interiors. So they 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 rule, and they will th they are thinking that lots of their their benefits will be stopped. I'm sure, and that's why there is an opposition. Uh, the, of course, they don't say it, but uh, as we know, the uh, the king that have that. Uh, full power, absolute power, on the Constitution and on the, his family. His, his family, the extended family, has endorsed the initiative of the Crown Prince. But I think the Crown Prince has to do it in the coming week and in two or three weeks because uh, things are moving very quickly, not only in Bahrain, but all over the Gulf. Uh, there are demonstrations in Amman and, and some parts of Saudi Arabia, and they are in Saudi Arabia. They are planning to uh, demonstrate on the 11th of March. Oh, we, we are, I'm not sure how and where, but it, uh, as I heard, it will be a big demonstration, and the government is not accepting this. So uh, I think the main obstacle now is the is that uh, in, you know the prime minister, the, the four of the government, I can say, it's not uh, 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 the the opposition insists that it should happen before uh, starting negotiating. And uh, and uh, what was.
was your second question about that? It was about um, the nature of the opposition. And, uh, I was wondering particularly yeah. about the Wafak uh, party, yes. uh, since it's the largest party. The opposition mainly is in uh, our Shia. And uh, there is the main opposition faction, I mean, uh, political party, we call it society, we are not allowed to make a party. <coughs> party. It's, uh, they are the, you know, they had 18 seats in the parliament, which is for, consists of 40. And uh, the rest of the other oppositions, and the secular oppositions, opposition is uh, formed, it has a great effect on the people, but it has fewer number, uh, less than a thousand, why, uh, you know, and without, you can say 90,000, whatever, I mean, they can just, it's a, a religious call, it's a religious call that uh, rules their uh, decisions by Sheikh Isa Qasim. And the head of the al wafaq Sheikh Ali Salman, also is, a, 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 I think, a, a mind person, but he has to follow the orders of Sheikh Isa Hassan. And uh, uh, while the secular opposition, like what our party, and uh, uh, it's a, a liberal leftist, I can say, and other two uh, secular parties. We are three secular parties. And there are also very small uh, Shia religious parties, also two or three. And that's all the, I mean, the, the opposition causes. While the, the Sunnah, I can say that they are frightened of what's happening. They feel that the Shia will take over. They feel, although Sheikh Ali Salman said, we don't mind if the new prime minister will be from the Sunnah, but he should be, he should not be from the ruling family. And this is a big change in the Gulf. It will affect the whole Gulf if this happens, because all the Gulf states have, you know, the rule and, and prime minister and most of the ministers are coming from the ruling families. Uh, so we have to wait and see how the uh, you know uh, dialogue will start and move gradually. Uh, as the crown prince say, we will not give you everything at in the first day, or the second day. We will give you few things now. After a few weeks, we'll give you something uh, because the whole Gulf is waiting. Uh, and the Sunnah are frightened, and now the Sunnah are trying, uh, not the Sunnah, but some religious uh, leaders, although the Sunnah don't have, uh, you know, the, the religious leaders of the Sunnah don't have the power to be followed by the <coughs> Shia religious leaders. It's different. The, the, the whole uh, sect, the ideology of the sect is different. We don't have a leader as we call them. But some religious chiefs, uh, and that's it. We heard that uh, I think it was Sheikh Mahmoud of the Sunnah uh, gave a yes. speech recently, and and yes. what we heard was uh, he was suggesting that maybe they need to form a militia against the Shia. No, no, no. He did not. He did not uh, say that. But he is, you know, he is supporting the government. Totally supporting the government. He is a colleague of mine. Used to be in the 80s and 90s and uh, at the University of Bahrain and he was also a rebel in, in the 90s but he changed and in, 90, in 92 he was arrested and then released and uh, brought back to the and uh, so and I even asked him to to speak in my tent and he said I, now I am neutral I am not siding by anyone so, uh, I mean, he is not a religious sheikh that should, he should be followed, not like the Shia. I mean, you can follow him or you cannot, but most of the Sunnah who are supporting the government are rallying behind him. Thank you.
I would, I would invite my, especially my colleagues Camille and Faiza and James Dorsey if they have questions as well, of course, as anybody else in the audience. And I think Camille actually does have a question or a comment, and I'll let her uh, come to the camera here. Um, uh, Marcel Taflo, <coughs> you, uh, the Shia leaders, secular and religious, relate to um, other Shia in the uh, in both uh, in the Arab world and uh, with the uh, Iran actual actual uh, Iranian uh, current. Thank you. Yes, uh, the, most of the Shia here comes. Most of the Shia come from Arab origin, mainly the eastern province of Saudi Arabia. So most of them are purely Arabs, and 50% of them can come from uh, Persian origin, and uh, the rest are Arabs. And they believe in mainly, you know, during the Arab nationalism. Uh, they had also, they established the al Aruba Club, al Aruba Club established by Shia individuals. And many of the leaders of Arab nationalism come from the <coughs> and few from the Sunnah. So uh, they are Arabs and they are uh, uh, part of the Arab League and part of the GCC. I mean, here they, they know exactly what their relation to, uh, to Iran is like any Shia uh, individuals. They visit the shrines there and during the Saddam Hussein period, they, you know, uh, mainly the, uh, not move, but uh, their attraction was to come. And they also uh, supported the uh, Iranian uh, revolution and uh, Khomeini, uh, Imam Khomeini, as they put it. Also, uh, some of them, you know, the Shia are different also. Uh, Shia Ikhbaris and other, uh, uh, you know, forms of Shia. Uh, but the Shia, you can say that religion uh, can uh, cross uh, borders, like uh, Catholics to the Vatican, you can say, like Sunnah to Al-Azhar in Cairo. Uh, ooh, I mean, people are, uh, Catholics are not traitors if they all you know, uh, support the Vatican in Rome, for example. And now, because of, <clears throat> after the liberation of uh, Iraq, uh, the, most of the Shia go back now to Iraq and visit. And there are lots of uh, Sistani, for example, in Najaf, many supporters of Sistani. But even between Iraq and Iran, this, you know, the sect plays a great role, but doesn't mean they, sub they are supporting Iran against their own country. They are sympathizing, I can say, and uh, uh, they have, they visit the, the Shia, most of the Shia, especially the villagers, are very religious, and they do the visits every year to Najaf, Karbala, and Qom, and different uh, cities in Iran also. Okay, thank you. Um, James, would you like to ask a question or make a comment? Um, <clears throat> I just had two questions, basically, as I uh, listened to your description of the political process in terms of where it stands now and where it would go. The first one was that you basically said we're, we're, the, the opposition really is only prepared to talk to the Crown Prince if and when the Prime Minister resigns, and that there was a window of about two to three weeks at most for that to happen, which essentially means that to some degree the uh, hardliners within the government would have the leverage because all they need to do is keep their legs stiff for those two or three weeks and nothing will happen. Uh, and the second question that I had was that if indeed that scenario, if the scenario I just uh, painted were not true and you would actually enter into negotiations <laughs> and you have a situation in which, as you quoted uh, the um, Crown Prince is saying, we're not going to give you everything immediately, we're going to do this gradually because we have to do so. 
in terms of relationships and balances within the region, how do you build guarantees into that process that those things that are promised to you uh, later down the road are actually then, uh, those promises are fulfilled? <coughs> Yes, uh, uh, first I would like to mention that uh, Mr. Feldman, the assistant of the Secretary Hillary Clinton, was here uh, last week and he met with different opposition parties and government and all parties. And he spent three days out of his five day tour through the camp, which means that they are paying a lot of attention to what's happening here. And what he said that the administration, Mr. Obama and Clinton, uh, uh, are paying attention and trying. It's not monitoring because the opposition asked for international monitoring that still hasn't been formed, that uh, 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 an international body could or should uh, uh, supervise. It will be very difficult, but uh, the assurance of the uh, the assurances of the American administration give a kind of uh, you know that the opposition felt that this will happen, and uh, and he explained by interviewing. I mean, I, last last Thursday. We were, I was with the editor-in-chief of uh, Al-Wasat, which is, who is a Shia, and I was there on the patio in the, at the, at the, they call it Tahrir now, uh, at the Lulu roundabout, and most of the, those who were there did not accept the, the word dialogue. They said, no, we want the system to be, to, to fall. And then you will have a dialogue. And I ask them, with whom you are going to have a dialogue of the system falls? And uh, now there is a lot of debate. But most of them are Shia there. But so many, so many progressive uh, political, not parties only, but uh, 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 civil society uh, organizations. For example, today, it's the 8th of March, and it's the Women's Day, uh, International Women's Day. And uh, there will be a huge demonstration, or rally, I can say, coming from the harbor to the roundabout, uh, full of women, of course, from different uh, political parties and from different just societies. Uh, NGOs, most of them are NGOs. So, Lots of people are participating now in the Lulu roundabout. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Tolliver. Uh, hello, Salam, Dr. Uh, Fakhru. I am Saad Fadid. Uh, I was uh, a member of parliament in Yemen. Uh, now, I have uh, some concern about when, when rulers not only the monarchies, but monarchies and republics, who have absolute power, uh, promise people reform. Uh, that's why I have uh, basically two questions. Uh, most of the time, when rulers with absolute power promise reform, they, they uh, concentrate it on economic reform. In other words, like housing and jobs and all that. But what is happening now in the minds of people in the streets in the Middle East is actually reform of the power structure or the power base, which is real reform in terms of democratic rights and, and uh, real giving power or distributing power amongst the people. Uh, that's, that's where my question comes from. Will, uh, I'll call them the people of Bahrain, uh, never mind being Shiites or Sunnis, uh, be be uh, satisfied with the economic reforms that may be promised now, and I know many people will immediately cash in on that, only to see that five or seven years later, uh, things are back to the same thing. Uh, will they be satisfied uh, as were promised, these reforms were promised in Saudi Arabia and in Jordan and Yemen even, 
who can't even afford uh, these uh, economic reforms. Uh, the second thing is, if the people of Bahrain were able to insist on real political restructuring, uh, in other words, having a real democracy and giving power to the people, uh, how much of that will be tolerated by the very close uh, influence of Saudi Arabia, which is uh, uh, which will be terrified, I think, will be, uh, by by the infection of this power restructuring that uh, that is supposed to happen, uh, starting from Bahrain or just like it happened in Egypt, Tunisia, Libya. I hope Yemen, and uh, I hope many other places too. Thank you very much. Yes, uh... As, uh, as far as I know, that uh, the reform, as you say, they are giving some materialist uh, things, some housing, some jobs, and then they forget about it. And after seven or ten years, they, revolt, they, you know, they demonstrate again, and they are giving more. And uh, this happened in the past. Yes. Now it's different. The whole Arab world is passing through a different... It's a different period, different era, and different age. It's the new generation, the youth who are carrying on this. Yes. And the youth are, as you know, that through internet and Facebook. And many of the, mainly the youth in Bahrain also. Uh, it's different now, and also because, you know, the U.S. knows clearly that it's different now. And uh, some of some of the spectrum, you know, of uh, specialized people think that it's uh, also the West is encouraging all this because uh, they are fighting Al Qaeda, and to fight Al Qaeda is to release the tension inside the Arabian Peninsula. We can see, and, and the rest, and they say the acts of Al-Qaeda is a little bit, as I heard, but Al-Qaeda is disappointed those days because the people are uh, very busy within their internal problems. They are trying even in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so it's part of the overall solution to Al-Qaeda and it's part of, and they are very peaceful. They did not carry a gun or a knife or any the old demonstrators all over the Arab, except now in Libya because they are defending themselves. Uh, uh, and your uh, second question? Saudi Arabia tolerance. Was? Uh, Saudi Arabia, and can Saudi Arabia tolerate a yes. genuine political opening in Bahrain? Well, I think they will be busy with what's happening in their own country. <laughs> and uh, now they are announcing that they are they will not allow any demonstration to happen in Saudi Arabia. Yesterday they say, but we are waiting for the 11th of March, for example. And uh, so Saudi, uh, the Crown Prince also visited all the GCC countries except, I mean, the main GCC countries, Kuwait, Qatar, uh, except Oman. I think did not visit because now Oman. Uh, Oman and Bahrain, uh, I think, are asking for funding because Oman also is witnessing uh, a kind of uh, well, maybe it, it doesn't sound like Bahrain, but uh, uh, Oman is have deep grievances. It's even more than Bahrain. And Bahrain, we can talk and shout and, and curse and do whatever we want and rally. And Oman, they cannot do anything. And, uh, and so every country, every state in the GCC uh, is busy with its own internal affairs, I think, these days. Can I ask a follow-up? follow-up? Yes. 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 Here's a follow-up from Mary. Hi, Dr. Munir. I just was no. wondering about um, the reports I've been seeing about Saudi troops going into Bahrain. How much credence can you give those reports? And if there are troops, are they now being pulled out to kind of deal with the internal Saudi problem? Yeah, I think we also saw this picture, but I think maybe it's fake because uh, and. Uh, 
maybe some Saudi scheme, but it's all coming from the Ministry of Interiors. I don't think they, right now, they need any uh, military help from Saudi Arabia. I think they need financial help from Saudi Arabia. Uh, and, uh, of course, Saudi Arabia is watching very, very carefully what's happening in Bahrain. As, as, as we know that they have two to three million Shia in the eastern province. And they have nearly uh, one to one and a half million Ismailis in the south, near the borders of Yemen. And, uh, uh, and the youth of uh, Saudi Arabia, are, they, you know, they look exactly like the youth of all over the world, all over at least the, the Gulf states. So they want a change, like the rest of the youth here, all over. Okay, uh, Faiza has a question here, please. Hi, my name is Faiza. I'd just like to ask, um, I, I was reading a report on uh, the Mufti of Saudi Arabia giving a fatwa that protests is haram and legitimate in Islam. So, and I, and I remember when Tahrir, uh, the protests in Tahrir happened, Ahli uh, Jumaa, the Grand Mufti, also said the same thing. Is there any attempt by the state in Bahrain, by the monarchy, to like uh, uh, delegitimize protests through the use of uh, religion, through the uh, influence of religion? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think that uh, you know the the difference and the difference in the ideology of Sunnah and Shia. As I told, as I said before, that <clears throat> the Shia follow their religious leaders, while the Sunnah don't care. They don't follow anything. Maybe if you would follow, but I can assure you that. Many will not follow the uh, because he is appointed. He is a government man, and he is appointed by the government, and everybody knows that. And the uh, Sunnah don't follow their own religious leaders because there is no religious leader. It's not even like Egypt; they have Al Azhar, while here they don't. And in Saudi Arabia, they are Wahhabis, and they have. Uh, uh, you know, it's uh, even, uh, that's why they just have, you know, direct connection between them and, and God, for example, let's say. Uh, they don't need any saints or any uh, religious leaders to follow. Yes, I, um, uh, I have a question. Wait a minute, I want to make sure that before we give you another turn, um, are there any other um, Questions? Okay. Yeah. Briefly, please. Yes, briefly. Uh, Doctor Mulia, I beg to differ with you. Uh, you said that the, the Shia follow the religious leaders. But a significant development which you did not mention here, and you living in Bahrain, very near to Iran, there is a lot of dissension inside the Shias in Iran. And, and um, for one, one uh, significant uh, result is uh, the people, uh, the Hezbollah in Lebanon has rejected uh, the theory of, of Ulaid al faqih as advocated by the Shah. If you, if you read his book, Kashf al-Asrar, you know exactly what I mean by uh, Ulaid al faqih They mean the power rests ultimately with the clerics. That is not in tandem with democracy. The, the, you are depriving the people of their voice. And this dissension is very big in Iran itself, but they were suppressed brutally. Uh, it, uh, the recent election is a perfect example of this. Even right now, the secret police uh, of, of Ahmadi Najad and the clerics are taking drastic action inside Iran. So not all Shias will follow their leaders blindly. They have rejected in total, in total, the doctrine of uh, Ulaid al fatih So in this way, the, the Iranian influence has dampened, has waned in the whole of the Middle East. Thank you very much. Could you have your comments, please? Yeah. Uh Many Shia do not accept Wilayat al faqih Yes. Um, for example, in Lebanon, Hassan Asrar accepts it, and, uh, and uh, uh, Hussein Fadlallah doesn't accept it. And he is well respected, Hussein Malik Hussein Fadlallah. 
uh, when uh, and Iran, of course, Benny, because you know that there is also a struggle in Iran yes. between, uh, I can say, this modernizers and uh, conservative. And as uh, one of my favorite professors at Columbia said, the new fight will be, will be between, not from, you will not have a fight from outside, the fight will be uh, within the, uh, each country between conservatives and modernizers. Yes. Yes. And I think Iran started this because it's settled. I mean, there is a revolution since for, uh, for more than 30 years. And maybe the Arab world, after settling uh, and having some of the democracy they need, they wanted, and they fought for, uh, there will be another fight, which will be among uh, modernizers and conservatives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and this is uh, this is what I expect. Maybe I'm right or wrong, and yeah. uh, this is the way I look at the future. Isn't it peculiar, Mira, uh, that uh, in Iran, maybe one thing that the uh, the rulers, the mullahs. Uh, and the protesters agree on, they both seem to uh, support the wave of protest that's going on in the Arab world. Yeah. Now, uh, they both, in, in one way or another, are inspired by it or claim credit for it. But from, from your point of view, as somebody who I think is, is with the protesters uh, in Bahrain, uh, what, what is your uh, assessment uh, about the view that is widely discussed, I know, in the United States, that uh, Iran uh, is benefiting a great deal in different ways from what is going on in the Arab world, and that Iran might even be uh, 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 intervening uh, covertly in Bahrain uh, to support the protest against the uh, monarchy. I mean, when they say, uh, when, when you have said that, that Iran might interfere covertly. Uh, you know, you, you mean with the help of the religious leaders or uh, with the help, you know, Iranians, from, uh, Bahrainis from Iranian origin are not so, so, I mean, they are now with the demonstrators, but the main, I mean, the Arab demonstrators, Arab Shia, are the ones, I mean, the leaders who sometimes support Iran. Uh, because the Iranian uh, Shia in Bahrain, I mean, Bahrainis of Iranian origin, are minority, and minorities always keep a uh, low profile. But uh, uh, the uh, interfering with Bahrain, I mean, Bahrain problem with Iran, dispute with Iran, has been resolved for a long time now. Uh, since Bahrain got its independence, and what strengthened this is the causeway to Saudi Arabia and uh, Bahrain, and uh, also the establishment of the Gulf uh, Cooperation Council. I mean, what to get from Iran, if there are some supporters to Iran, what to get from Iran? Financial support? Uh, Weapons? Uh, what is it? I mean, the job, I mean, employment, money and funding and programs and, uh, is with the uh, rest of the Gulf state and the rest of the Arab countries. It's, this is very, very clear to the Bahrains. Would you say that uh, it is incorrect, therefore, to uh, argue that uh, what is going on in Bahrain is really a kind of a proxy struggle for influence between Saudi Arabia and Iran? If the, if the dialogue will, will fail, if the dialogue will fail, it will be turned into, uh, I can say, proxies between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And this is what Sheikh Ali Salman, the head of al warned, that if we have to reach a decision, we have to reach some sort of solutions in the dialogue, or else Bahrain, uh, will be a theater for this struggle, and we don't want this to happen. Nobody wants this to happen. 
But if you had to guess, if you had to uh, put a number on it, what, what do you think the percentage chances are that uh, things will break down and that negotiations really will not work and that things might get really ugly? More than 10 percent, I can see. Because everybody is frightened now. Everybody, and everybody feels that it is serious. And the Sunnah are feeling serious and insecure more, more than anyone else. This is, this is what I know. It's, uh, it's a serious situation and we, we think we have to solve it. Everybody, all factions need to solve it. If you were to look at the uh, possible ultimate solution here, would it yes. be something like this? Would it be that the, the Prime Minister, Sheikh Khalifa, will have to go? He has to be kicked out. Uh, and yeah. the government has to change, that that would be absolutely a requirement. Uh, would, if, if, the, if the king were to do that, and in addition come through with some of these economic uh, promises that you mentioned earlier, would that be sufficient to bring things uh, back to normal? It will calm, calm down the situation. It will not bring uh, the situation to normal because people have lots of demand. And the, well, as the current prince said, it will be fulfilled, but fulfilled gradually. And with the monitoring of the international powers, I, I, the US uh, promised to monitor. And to, not to monitor physically, but they are watching the situation very, very closely. This is what uh, Mr. Feldman said. So uh, what else we could say? I mean, uh, this is what we, uh, the opposition got from, uh, I mean, the assurances they got. But uh, there is another uh, important factor that if things uh, get more severe around us, I will not mention any country, I mean in the GCC, uh, this is, there will be another story. There's um, uh, an analysis that appeared, I think, in one of the American uh, papers uh, just I think, yes. yesterday, uh, uh, claiming, arguing that uh, the Obama administration is now really a shifting course, whereas uh, it came out in pretty good support for the protesters in Tunisia and Egypt and, yeah. and in Libya. Uh, when it comes to Bahrain and the Gulf and maybe, maybe even Yemen, the, the administration uh, is trying, wants to curb the protest and is leaning uh, toward supporting the, uh, in the incumbent regimes. I'm wondering, does that sound right to you? And is, is that um, consistent with what your uh, understanding of what Feldman said? It may be part of it is true for the Gulf, but not for Yemen. Yemen is a republic, and, uh, and the president can be replaced very easily. Uh, while the rest of the Gulf monarchies are very strong, very powerful. They have, let's look what Gaddafi uh, has, he is fighting right now. And uh, we are not sure how things will develop, but uh, everybody now in Bahrain, I'm talking about Bahrain, is uh, uh, that uh, they want the, to reach consensus, and just in the middle, uh, maybe most of uh, some of their uh, demands will not be met, but uh, most of the demands will, I think, will be answered. And uh, uh, as you know, that the price of oil is increasing, and a lot more accumulation of wealth in the Gulf, and they can do some, uh, most of the uh, projects they promised. It's, it's very easy. You can imagine if the, you know, the, 
the, yeah, why the U.S. want this to be resolved in the, you know, uh, uh, without tackling the structure of the Gulf monarchies. Uh, as you know, the, uh, the price of uh, oil is increasing. The barrel now is 118, I think, dollars. And I don't think the U.S. or any country in the world want to see uh, the barrel coming for 200, for example, very soon. Mm -hmm. At least they can deal with the 100 right now. That's why they have to calm down the situation. It's the price of the oil, I think, that rules up here. And are, are you fairly uh, comfortable with, uh, with the American position then? on Bahrain. Uh, I mean, you're a member of the opposition, uh, and you're also saying that, that the Americans want to calm things down. Uh, I'm yes. not quite sure how pleased you are with the way the Obama administration is, is handling itself. Well, if I am pleased or angry, it doesn't matter here. Uh, this is politics, and the U.S. is uh, dealing, uh, it, it has its own interests. They don't care whether we, we are happy or not, if it suits them or not. And what suits the U.S. Uh, and the West now is not to raise the price of the uh, oil uh, anymore. So they have to calm down the situation for a while, I can see. And uh, to calm it down is to sit down on a table negotiating with the uh, ruling family, with the crown prince, until we reach and we are promised to get lots of funding for the projects uh, and the housing projects mainly. Uh, and this will calm the situation. And of course, there, will, there should be, uh, this is what the opposition says, that there will be lots of reforms, especially regarding the uh, that the Prime Minister will be from the people, not anymore from the uh, uh, ruling family. Or maybe, in the, you know, I mean, at the end of the negotiation, this should happen, not now, let's see. So does that uh, mean essentially... So yeah, go ahead. Yes. No, it's okay. Does, does, does that mean essentially a constitutional amendment that will turn Bahrain into a constitutional monarchy? Yeah, yeah. This is what the uh, a constitutional monarchy, even the head, the religious uh, Sheikh Issa Qasem said, we want a constitutional monarchy. Uh, when you, we can get an, uh, uh, a constitutional monarchy will satisfy the opposition. Okay, we have run a bit over time, and uh, we don't want to tax you too much, but I know Camille has a question, and if there are any other questions, we can take maybe one or two more, but then we'll have to uh, let Dr. Fakhro uh, uh, get back to, I think, the uh, rally that she spoke of, uh, which I'm sure she wants to attend in a little while. No, no, I have, uh, I have another, uh, I am also a member of the Supreme Council, headed by the First Lady, and we are having a meeting later on at 12.30, which I, I have another hour or something. Well, let me... Let me so I have both parties. Okay, <coughs> all right, we will be able to take then a couple more questions. And Camille has yes. one. You want to stand up? Uh, Dr. Fakhru, you may have answered my question in many ways, but I would like to have a direct answer to this question. If we are at the edge of a breakdown, uh, with the people are claiming for political reforms, we know that the answer for political reforms cannot be economic reforms or, or uh, uh, release of uh, economic uh, tensions. Or I would like to know if uh, the discrimination, political practice and social practice in Bahrain is written somewhere or is it just the result of customs and how would the opposition envisage on top of uh, having a uh, parliamentary monarchy, uh, deep reforms in your society. Yes, now the power, all power, is in the hand of the king. 
and they can do whatever they want and that's why they had such ugly projects like naturalization and bringing a new citizen to replace their own citizens and this is the worst the worst project that they had in the last 10 years uh, which created a lot of grievances among the Shia because the Shia are with well, 75% as many international uh, uh, experts think that they are still 70% right now. So there are um, nearly, nearly, and we are not sure, 60,000 naturalized in the last uh, uh, 10 years, we can say, uh, and recruited in the army and uh, the Ministry of Interiors, in the Ministry of Interiors. Uh, what the people, what the opposition want is not only financial and uh, housing and, and recruitment inside the Ministry of Interiors and in the Army, but also a reform, a deep reform. It's a constitutional monarchy. The first thing is to dissolve both uh, chambers, the parliament, and start electing people just to write that this is what happened in 1972 when people uh, uh, elected a body 20 persons and the government appointed 20 with the international experts they wrote a constitution similar to the kuwaiti constitution right now but all of a sudden in 2001 until 2002, they changed uh, this const the old constitution, constitution totally, where they put the, the old power in the hands of uh, uh, the king. And this is unacceptable right now. Can you just ask okay. about the concessions that were made already by the king? Um, yes, would you like to put that question? Okay. <coughs> okay, Professor. Uh, I just want to ask: Has the king or the ruling, uh, ruling uh, the royalty, have they begun to give concessions? And what are the concessions that they have given already, uh, as as of today? Thank you. Well, we we are not told. We, the day before yesterday, he met with the heads of his uh, the ruling party, the, the, the ruling family, and they showed us on TV that he met with them, but. We don't know exactly what he told them. Maybe he told them that uh, uh, what's going to happen in the, in the near future, that uh, they're, uh, I think, mainly uh, financial. But I think what he told them, and I'm not sure, that their uh, salaries will be not the poorest, but uh, limited. And when, uh, this is what we have that they should be asked to work as the rest of the people and get uh, uh, get uh, you know their living, living through the uh, uh, through working and uh, but we are not sure. We know that he met with them the day before yesterday in his palace and we saw them coming, all of them, in hundreds. That that's that's all that they that, that's all that the, the the king has given up so far. No, he released all political prisoners. He withdrew all army and police from the Lulu roundabout, and he promised that uh, twenty thousand uh, uh, people Bahrainis will be recruited in, at the, in the Ministry of Interiors. And he promised that 50,000 units will be built. Uh, this is this is all what he did right now, till now. Okay, I, uh, there's a question here in the back. Yes, please. This will be probably the last or next to last question. Come on up, please. security situation in Bahrain is going to further progress and if the negotiation with the opposition fails, 
Would violence arise and would there be any interventions from other countries such as Saudi or even the US? Okay. Well, you are presenting the worst scenario. <laughs> uh, and this might happen, but this is, will be the worst scenario we expect. And uh, we think that many wise people do not. Now, even the, men, the Chamber of Commerce is interfering because the businessmen, the business is deteriorating in Bahrain. Business is, uh, nobody is buying and selling, and uh, many projects uh, canceled, was canceled, and also. So everyone in this island feel the danger and feel that they, anybody doesn't want the worst scenario. They want Bahrain as a place, as it used to be, but people should share power and should share wealth with everyone. Uh, now only few get everything and the rest do not get anything. They want more justice and more uh, democracy and equality. This is what, especially the new generation. Okay, just uh, one last quick uh, sort of historical question. Unless they oh yes, hang on, one more here, okay. <laughs> I see you are a very liberated woman. I'm very concerned about the status of women in the Middle East, especially in Bahrain. Mm -hmm. How healthy is yes. it? Can you tell us something about the uh, uh, women liberation movement there? How active are they? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, they are very active, very, very active. But there are also women that uh, who are more uh, Islamist uh, societies also. And as you know that al wafaq for example, the Shia party, <coughs> is, uh, is the largest. Also, the women, uh, the branch of women in al wafaq also is very large. And they want, they follow, uh, uh, unfortunately, they follow the uh, view of the Iranian view. So, so even the Sunnah, then, yeah, you know, a few, seven years ago, I remember, we demonstrated uh, to have a new status law, personal status law. We were less than 1,000, and the Shia religious women were 14,000. They were carrying a Quran in their hands, and they said, this is the law that makes women equal. Um, but today, I think everybody would demonstrate uh, modern, uh, modern women, more uh, progressive, and um, it's more national. It's not, but you know, after everything settled down, I think we will start uh, having this problem again. It will be a crisis. It's a mess. So I think this is what we expect in the future. But let's get something. Now, something different than this. Uh, just one, uh, wait a minute, just, just one more question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, you did not mention um, that there has been any uh, demand among the protesters uh, to close the American base in Bahrain. And um, I thought that was rather curious because in the past, uh, one of the demands of nationalist protesters in other countries in the Middle East has been getting rid of a British base, for example, or, or uh, uh, foreign forces. You're talking about Jamal of the Nasser period, Arab national, the rise of Arab nationalism. Yes. And now it's different, especially the youth. Yes. They want to connect with the West. Yes. And they want to have different... Uh, they, we don't have any, any... Uh, I can say uh, dispute, except the dispute that uh, uh, they are keeping quiet about what's happening in the uh, Arab countries. They are supporting the dictators, and this is the dispute. But if they support, they are supporting us. Uh, what Sheikh Ali Salman also said uh, to Fitman that. We, we, we have the base, we will protect it, we support. I mean, we will keep all the agreements. We will keep all the agreements that
that the Bahraini government signed. And uh, as you know, there are the, the, we have the fifth fleet and, and, and the base of the fifth fleet, and there is the biggest base outside the U.S. in Qatar, the AD base. Uh, we, there are many bases around the Gulf uh, states, but uh, people I don't think they do care about this right now. If the U.S. is uh, do, you know, helping people, and I think the battle among the youth is not a battle of fighting American bases. It's uh, fighting injustice and uh, trying to have equality and justice with the help of the West. I can say the U.S. only. Well, on that uh, relatively upbeat note, I would like to thank you very much, Dr. Munira Fatro, uh, for your excellent uh, presentation. We're all most grateful, and also to Camille Germanis for her very fine uh, presentation of the Bahraini uh, historical background. So thank you so much. I've been in uh, Singapore one day, and uh, I, I, I like it very, very much. Yeah. Well, maybe we can persuade you to come back again. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Goodbye.